Welcome back to Mad Medicine. In this lecture, we're going to be discussing part two of our cellular necrosis series. Now, if you haven't already done so, don't forget to subscribe because uh, your support allows us to keep this content for free. Now, we've already discussed part one. In part one, we discussed the first three types of necrosis. In part two, we're going to do a quick recap of cell injury and necrosis, and then we'll finish off by discussing the last three types of necrosis. So, we're gonna first start off by discussing cell injury. Now your cells have the ability to adapt to a certain level of stress through various mechanisms like hyperplasia, hypertrophy, and even metaplasia. But when you have too much stress on a cell that far exceeds the cell's ability to handle that cell or adapt to that stress with hyperplasia or uh, hypertrophy or metaplasia, your cell is going to get injured and that's when cell injury is happening. Now there are many different ranges of injury we're not gonna be discussing today. We discussed it in a previous lecture for cell injury, but the two main things you need to know is that you have cellular damage occurring in two stages. The first stage is reversible damage, where you have cells that swell up due to blocking the sodium potassium ATP pumps, which causes more uh, sodium inside the cell, meaning the cell is going to swell. If you do not remove stress at that point, you will go to the irreversible stage where you have cellular membrane as well as mitochondrial and lysosomal membrane damage occurring. And when the contents of a membrane get damaged or the, when the membranes get damaged and the contents get released, either intracellular or extracellularly, that cell is going to go to cell death. And this is essentially the central dogma of uh, cell injury that you need to remember. So with that being said, let's review necrosis. Necrosis, cellular necrosis, is when cells die off in a large scale. Usually this occurs extracellularly, meaning you have an exogenous cell injury that's resulting in uncontrolled cellular death. So this is extracellular. Okay. Now, because it is happening from outside of the cell, our cells themselves do not want to die. So they are going to in, they are going to inactivate their intrinsic uh, apoptotic mechanisms. The normal cellular enzymes that are responsible for controlled cell death will be inactivated because the cell doesn't want to die. It doesn't want to make it easier for whatever exogenous insult to kill itself off. Okay, that's what it doesn't want to do, and it still wants to retain some function before it goes out. So usually this is occurring due to some pathologic process, and the key principles are that you are going to have release of intracellular components, which makes sense, but also you can have inflammation. And the inflammation part is very important because this is essentially what is speeding up the necrosis. Inflammation can lead to further insult, it can lead to more damage, and it can lead to less inf uh, uh, blood perfusion, uh, uh, stronger infarction, et cetera, et cetera. So the inflammation is a stimulating or a, I guess, um, it's, a, it, it's something that just speeds up the whole process. Now, there are several different types of necrosis. We've already discussed the first three in our previous lecture in part one, but today we're gonna to be discussing gangrenous fat and fibrinoid necrosis. So let's start off by talking about gangrenous necrosis. Gangrenous necrosis is probably what you think about when you think about the typical necrotic tissue, right? Well, it's essentially necrotic tissue that occurs in the extremities. This can also happen in the GI tract, especially with like uh, chronic ischemia or ischemic colitis, but it's usually a type of uh, necrosis that can either be coagulative or uh, liquefactive. And it is combined, you know, it can have both aspects, but the main thing you need to know is that it can be both coagulative or liquefactive. Now, Often you're going to see this in diabetics, and that's very important because diabetes puts you at a higher risk of getting these infections because it leads to neuropathy. Because you have neuropathy, the, the distal nerves, especially in the extremities, are not able to sense the problems that are happening, the cuts, etc., etc., and along with the cuts, Diabetics have longer healing time because we know that high blood sugar levels make it harder for our body to actually heal wounds. So when you have wounds occurring in your distal extremities and they are not getting better, you are going to get gangrenous tissue there. That is why we see this in diabetics. So for all intent and purposes, in your mind, you can equate gangrenous necrosis a lot of times with diabetics. Diabetics can even get gastro, diabetic gastroparesis. Their, the, their uh, disease can also affect the GI tract. So it kind of all connects in a way, but especially with the extremities, think of diabetics. So there are two main types of necrosis when it comes to gangrene. You have wet gangrene and dry gangrene. 
Dry gangrene is when you have coagulative necrosis happening. And when you have wet gangrene, you have liquefactive necrosis. The names kind of give it away. Liquefactive uh, liquids are pretty wet, so wet gangrene, dry is just the other one, okay? So in dry gangrene, essentially you are going to get an ischemic tissue where you're gonna have coagulative necrosis without any sort of bacterial infection, okay? There is no bacterial infection happening. But in liquefactive necrosis, you are going to see liquefactive necrosis, or wet, sorry, with wet gangrene, you are going to see liquefactive necrosis with a superimposed or like um, uh, essentially a bacterial infection happening at the same time or on top of the actual gangrene. This wet gangrene positive infection Dry gangrene, no infection. Okay, even though there's no infection in dry gangrene, uh, gangrene, you are going to have ischemia. And in wet gangrene, you are going to not have any ischemia. That makes sense because in an ischemic infarction, you are going to see coagulative necrosis because you want to maintain the structure. In wet gangrene, you are not going to have uh, any ischemia. In fact, you are going to see that liquefactive necrosis occurring because of the infection. The infection is going to lead our macrophages and neutrophils. Uh, it's going to cause those cells, those white blood cells, to release enzymes so that it can kill off the cells that are infected with the bacteria or even the virus. And when that happens, you are going to see the liquefactive aspect of the tissue. So here are two photos of both types of gangrene. As you can see, this, this tissue is very dry, and this is what dry gangrene looks like. And this tissue looks swollen, it is red, and you see this blister forming. This is wet gangrene happening right here. Pretty straightforward, as the names say. So that is uh, gangrenous necrosis. Next, we're gonna move on to fat necrosis. Fat necrosis occurs when the tissue, the fat tissue becomes necrotic. And when that happens, the fat tissue will become a hard mass. So fat necrosis, the hallmark is essentially necrotic tissue, necrotic fat tissue that becomes a hard mass. Usually this is gonna happen due to damage to the fat cells that are there. When fat cells get damaged, they're gonna release lipase. Lipase breaks down triglycerides, and when they break down triglycerides, you're gonna release fatty acids. Those fatty acids will bind to calcium and calcium is going to lead to the spawnification of fat and that will also lead to hardening of the tissue and that's how fat cells become hard. Essentially, it's by releasing lipase which leads to essentially calcium being bound to the fatty acids which means the tissue is becoming so uh, it's going through spawnification. Now this is going to happen in two main locations, okay? Very important, very high yield. This is something you will definitely be tested on, if not pimped on, uh, on rounds. Number one is going to be the breast. When the breast tissue gets damaged due to trauma, it can present as a hard calcified mass. A lot of times, especially for example, if someone, if a female gets uh, injured in a car accident and she has a seat belt across her chest, that seat belt can lead to trauma to that area. Even though it doesn't lead to any like visible skin damage, it will lead to trauma in the breast. When that happens and the fat cells get released, they get lysed and they get damaged and they release the lipase and then lead to spawnification downstream, they're going to uh, see a hard mass in their breast. And that female might present to the hospital or to the clinic saying that I have a hard mass in my breast. Can you check it out? And that might lead you down to thinking about breast cancer, but you need to rule out any sort of uh, uh, necrosis happening, any fat necrosis happening that might have caused uh, the breast tissue to become essentially into a hard mass, okay? That's the first main location you need to know about very high yield. And then the second location is the pancreas. The pancreas is going to lead to a pancreatic enzyme uh, destruction of the, the cells in the pancreas and the fat cells, especially the pancreas has a lot of lipase, pancreatic lipase will cause the same thing to happen. 
and you are going to see spawnification occurring as well in the pancreas, okay? So that is fat necrosis. And when we're talking about the actual histologic slide, you're gonna see outlines of the dead fat cells without any nuclei, and you're gonna see spawnification with uh, calcium being uh, uh, bound to the actual cell or to that region. As you can see, these are a lot of fat, dead, uh, dead fat cells. There are no nuclei which is a hallmark of fat necrosis. Okay, so the last one is fibrinoid necrosis. The hallmark of fibrinoid necrosis is tissue that becomes necrotic in blood vessel walls, okay? This is gonna be caused by usually immune reactions in the vessels. So think about polyarteritis, nodosa, even other conditions like preeclampsia or even a hypertensive emergency. These can lead to fibrinoid necrosis. And usually it's going to happen because of proteins leaking from the, well, the, the vessel wall. When the proteins leak, that tissue is going to become necrotic. Now the mechanism essentially is that this is a type of hypersensitivity reaction, a type 3 hypersensitivity reaction, where immune complexes are going to bind to fibrin. And when that happens, they're going to lead to wall vessel damage, also further uh, causing the proteins from leaking uh, from the, the actual vessel, the vessel wall. Now the histologic characterization is that you're going to see thick, pink blood vessel walls, okay? Something you normally shouldn't see. It should just be all the same color. And as you can see right here, this is an example of fibrinoid necrosis, more so in this region right here and right here, okay? This uh, blood vessel wall should not be this color. This is very pink. And you see there are lack of nuclei. There's one nuclei right here and right here. But this whole region right here and here does not have any nuclei. This is because of fibrinoid necrosis. Fibrinoid necrosis, remember, is usually due to either a short period of really high, really, really high blood pressures, like a hypertensive emergency or preeclampsia, or some sort of autoimmune uh, condition that affects the blood vessels, either the small, the medium, or large blood vessels, okay? And with that being said, this is the end of the two-part lecture series on necrosis, on cellular necrosis. So if you found this helpful, don't forget to subscribe to our channel because your support means a lot to us. It really allows us to keep this content free. And if you want to see more content like this, uh, go to our website, www.madmedicine.org, where you can find more free content. Thanks.